coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. Our planet is a finite resource. Our natural resources are finite. Our clean water is finite. Our clean air is finite. Our ability to pump carbon into the atmosphere is, is, is finite. And so underneath that, how can we consider for ourselves a space where we can grow infinitely against this precious life-supporting resource that is limited, that will only last so long? Right. And that is a part of the way that I think we come at both this tension of growth. Why would Patagonia slow its growth as well as a commitment to regeneration? That was Ted Manning describing why slowing their business growth is one part of the Patagonia plan. Digging into the why behind one of the leaders in conservation and business today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the show. If you want to find some groups to support, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash planet. And uh, we'll have a link, some links there to some of the groups we've had on the podcast and some of the uh, some of the groups that we've talked about uh, here today on the podcast. Good chance uh, to find somebody to support. Today's episode is sponsored by Togan's Fly Shop, providing superior products at an affordable price. A great resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fishing accessories. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash tokens right now to get started. That's wetflyswing.com slash tokens, T-O-G-E-N-S. You support this podcast by clicking through that link. Ted Manning is here to walk us behind the scenes of the company Patagonia and the history of how they've created this, uh, this amazing company around conservation and protecting our home planet. We hear the story of the founder, Yvonne Chouinard, who talks about how he never planned on building a billion dollar company. We find out what some of the big struggles are to creating a large ethical company focused on conservation and why they changed their company mission to saving our home planet. I'm very excited to share this one with you and I hope it inspires you to take some action today. So without further ado, here he is, Ted Manning from Patagonia.com. How's it going, Ted? It's going really well, Dave. Nice to be with you this morning. Yeah, thanks for putting this together. I know you've got a busy schedule, and uh, so I'm glad you can get a little hour here to dig into Patagonia, the great stuff you guys have going. Um, I always start off, we're going to talk about some of the products and the conservation stuff and, and how you guys are really leading, because I can tell you on this podcast, your name has come up a lot of times, and sometimes it's just me talking about like, you know, Yvonne saying how like you guys have changed your mission, right, to save the planet and all this stuff. So, I mean you've done all this stuff along the way as a company that's leading and I want to dig into that. But before we get there, let's talk about first how you got into fly fishing and then we'll get into some of the other stuff. All right. Well, I, I grew up a, an angler, you know, fishing with my, my father and my brother in uh, the woods of Virginia predominantly, and then was at the university of New Hampshire um, and actually just celebrated this event recently, coincidentally enough. Uh, so about 29 years ago, I went on a fishing trip with a bunch of college friends to the Adirondacks and I was a spin fisherman at the time. And there's some debate on how this story goes, Dave. So if my friends are listening, they may, you know, they may disagree. (laughs) Uh, However, I'll tell you how I recall it. So we drove from the University of New Hampshire and Durham to, you know, upstate New York and into the Adirondacks. And when we got to the Adirondacks to go, you know, spend five days or so fishing, lo and behold, my spinning rod was gone. It had been broken or lost or left behind. And my only recourse was to borrow a friend's fly rod. So I spent about a day and a half on a hemlock, hemlock choked Adirondack River looking for brookies, mostly catching trees, hating my friends for this prank that they pulled on me. <laughs> and on day two, found my way into a brookie on a, on a woolly bugger that we had floated underneath some of these hemlocks that had been eating my flies. And I was a, a rapid convert. Um, nice. I have been you know, fly fishing pretty much exclusively since then. When my sons were born, I came back into some of the trad gear. It was difficult to put three yep. kids and oh, yeah. fly rods in a canoe, but um, but fly fishing has been my my primary love affair. Nice. And so, so that same group of friends and I, we hit the Gunnison this year as a, a remembrance. It was about oh, 29 wow. years ago this summer. Holy um, cow. So we, co- yeah, we coincided our trip with the salmon fly hatch and had an epic and shared whiskey and laughed and told stories. There you go. There you go. Nice. Yeah. So so you've got that going and then just Patagonia, because it seems like the position you have, and maybe you talk just briefly um, about your position, then how you ran into Patagonia to where you are. Okay. Um, so my, we're a title, this organization, one of the, mm, one of the unique things about right. Patagonia, but the way you can understand me would be a senior business leader or a business unit director. That would be a, a former title. 
we organize, if, if you can imagine Patagonia as a kind of a profound nonprofit meets a product brand company, and we sort of smash those two together and figure it out as we go. We organize our business around five business units. Each business unit is, is created around this idea of intersectionality, the products that we build with the communities that were intended to impact. Our business units are Life Outdoors. That would be our activist workwear kids sportswear product. Uh, mountains, so you can imagine sort of vertical sports, ski and climb. Trails, that's you're going to get your dirt sports there, your bike run, hikes. Uh, ocean, so that's our logo business and our surf business. And then the business unit that I represent is called Rivers. And so we make the equipment, the accessories, and all of the fly fishing gear for Patagonia. And our commitment is to the communities that advocate and recreate on rivers, right? So really a, a really powerful clean and wild water and wild fish perspective that we then use to build everything from duffel bags to sun hats to gloves and socks. Right. That's it. Yeah. And how do you guys choose? Because there's a lot of stuff going on out there. There's a lot of events. There's probably a lot of, you probably get a lot of calls from people. How do you guys choose where you're going to work with? You got this new, say, group, or maybe it's a conservation group or something out there, and they want you guys to support them in some form. How do you choose where you're going next? It's not easy. Um, and it, I think it's one of the more challenging portions of the job here, not just for you know my team, but Patagonia in general. We're a, we're a big hearted group of people who act with urgency and believe you know, that mission is really what drives our work. We find ourselves really committing to a lot of things. There's a lot of issues that Patagonia leans in on with our big voice. And we try to operate at a, at a global perspective. So having big conversations around things that matter in, in our world, think artificial as a film where we kind of began a, ha a conversation around hatchery. And then we try really hard to come down and support at a grassroots level. I don't think we're perfect. There's certainly events that we would love to be a part of that we aren't able to get to. There are things that I think we miss along the way, but we do our best to try to create that balance. How do you bring to bear the power of a big global brand, you know, but enable those communities that are acting on the ground that, that ultimately really get the, the work done. And, and we're clear about that, you know, with, with the power of brand, we can create narrative and awareness and space for important changing conversations, but we really believe the work needs to be done on the ground. And when we look at the places where we feel like we've won, if you'll allow that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that phrase where we've made yep. a difference, it's by empowering people on the ground. And so a lot of it is looking for places where we can connect the power of brand to a community that's doing the work on the ground. Gotcha. So for an example, you, you might have, I could think like a small, um, you know, nonprofit that's up in some state, right. And maybe no, not many people know about them, but they're on the, the ground doing good work and uh, exactly. you might come in and, and do whatever it might be funding or it might be maybe videos or something, but you're going to support them potentially if you believe in that, you know, their message to help them Correct. get the message out to the world, the country. We have a tool called Action Works that we've been running where you can go online and see the organizations. You can search it by zip code. You know, these are the folks that we're partnering with at a grassroots level. And then from that menu of, of options, we, we lift some of those stories into big content films, large email campaigns, narrative around product. You know, then additionally, our team, the, the Rivers team, the Fish team specifically, you know, we run a sales force like, like most of the brands in our, in our industry do. But we don't think of them as reps. We call them regional community leaders. And part of their job, part of what they're tasked to do is the classic, you know, let's let's manage these businesses with these select retailers. But a big part of their job is to help connect us and the power of the global brand to that community at a regional level, right? And so we really look to them and expect them to be endemic and authentic and help us see what the opportunity might look like. So Dave gotcha. Allen living in Colorado, right? The angler alls relationship and those key flash shop relationships, those are really important to us. And we expect Dave to help us understand what's happening with the watersheds and with, uh, with access and with uh, ag water rights, you know, the big issues that are kind of informing Colorado so that we can create that connectivity. You know, again, how do you bring the power of a global brand to bear on, you know, one square meter of land or right. one watershed or one tributary? That's it. That's it. And that's the power is that the, uh, empowering as local as you can get the grassroots, right? Because that's the, what's, what's the saying, the um, never underestimate what a small group of committed individuals can do, right? Or whatever, I'm kind of blowing that one a little yep. bit. But, you know, it's like, that's it. It's like, that's the power. That's where all these, even Yvonne, you know, you look at his story, it's like, you know, it's an amazing story, right? But he's through the whole thing kind of been this guy. It seems like he's been this guy, you know, almost a grassroots guy the whole way, even though he's built this big company, right? And he's still continuing yeah. that message the whole time. Very much so. But he really 
deeply believes in the simplification of these things. Create awareness at a really broad level, but simplify your approach to the solutions, to particularly to product, to you know, the focus of who we are and what we look like when we're really trying to create impact. The more you know, the less you need, right? That's the classic Yvonne quote. Right. We generally apply that one to product, but if we think about that, right, the more awareness we create, we're able to act at a relatively small level and have meaningful, meaningful impact. Yeah, yeah. Well, another, and I'm not sure if this is a uh, Yuval, I think I might've heard him on a podcast, but it's like, you know, Patagonia breaks the rules, right? I mean, that's what you guys have done a long time. Describe that. What does that mean when you, in a good way, right? You guys, you've been breaking the rules for a long time. And I think what he was talking about in that was the fact that, um, you know, I don't know exactly what the quote was, but essentially, I mean, you guys are doing things differently than everybody, right? And now you're leading. And what does that, if I just throw that out to you, what does that mean to you? Breaking the rules. I think there's a few things. The first thing that comes to mind, we're a unique organization internally. We don't operate the same way as most brands. We, you know, we're, we're running a, a responsible business in a non-traditional way for sure. Um, and I think that's part of the power of Patagonia. We're not running in classic architectures of organization. We're not running with classic market share goals. You know, we're expected to run a sustainable, healthy business, but one that's really able to engage this broad piece of mission. For a lot of people, I came from 25 years in outdoor. I've been at Patagonia just coming up on four. The first year and a half or two, I would call an unlearning. You know, well, building product and leading product teams was something I was really familiar with. Doing it here, it's done in a different way. You know, and that's the that's part of the power of the brand is sort of finding your way collectively and collaboratively towards achieving these like, really lofty ideas. You know, I come to work every day to to save a planet. Um, and that's a very different way to think about how you build a duffel bag or a pair of waders or push innovation into a, into a future product category. That's it. We think about sales very differently. You know, we're not a, well, we're certainly aware of the power of our brand and kind of running at, um, at those opportunities. That isn't a primary goal. You know, we're not building product from a market share perspective to try to, to take from others. We're not building product in a way that would, kind of result in there being, in our perspective, more product than is necessary. We really work hard to understand, you know, do we have, if you'll allow this permission, you know, to build this product, is it, is it warranted? Is it necessary in the community? Can the planet afford to have the product be made? And that's another way in which, you know, we're really enabled to be quite, quite a bit different. Um, and then underneath mission, you know, in, particularly inherent in the sort of the, our commitment to mission, we're free to make decisions as individuals and teams that align with mission on a, on a daily basis. And in a classic organization or brand, you'd have a command and control structure, right? There'd be a kind of a top, really strong top-down perspective that we were all aligned with. And it, I'm not saying our senior team doesn't set great direction for us, but they operate in a way that would allow me or my team to really navigate within a, a broad range on what we think is right to do, you know, in regards to succeeding in the, the mission. So if we feel that, you know, focusing our North America account base is really the right thing to do to get it to impact, we're, we're free to do that. If we feel like making less product is the best way to minimize impact, we're free to do that. And in, and in classic brands, that would be a really challenged conversation. That would be a hard thing right. to get your head around if you were even allowed to do it at all. That's it. And, and the mission is that, I mean, I can't remember the exact, but it's you're in the we're in business to save our home planet. To yeah. save your home planet, right? And, and it's yeah. which is and, and that change was. And I can't remember what the old mission was, but do you, I don't even remember. Do you remember what the old before this one? The old mission was a kind of a three part mission about building product that does no harm, inspiring others to to create change and right, and really minimizing our own impact. Um, yeah, yeah. The mission statement change is how I come into the brand. You know, Yvonne was we had a transition in the fishing team. And he knew he was going to be changing the mission statement. And he was curious. He had this curiosity and he was exploring what a mission change like ours would mean to a, to a fishing business. And so that was the question that drew me into the process. I was curious about what I was curious about that question. And I was curious about what permissions Patagonia might give somebody to go and, and answer that question. Again, very, a very unique approach mm-hmm. to product. I mean, we're a brand yeah. that sues presidents, right? We're not afraid to can we talk right. about doing something differently. You know, in the classic, don't politicize your business, don't politicize your brand. That doesn't exist here. That's not um, a rule. No, no, that's not a rule. And, and it isn't a desire to be divisive. That's that's not us. You know, we, we really work to, to pull people in under the tent, but we act, with, we act with a tremendous amount of urgency. And we think one of the most powerful things we can do at this, at this broadband, broad brand perspective, this global brand perspective is create awareness really push conversations you know, out even into the uncomfortable so that we're having dialogue about what that might mean at a global level, at a community level, at an individual level. 
I think artificial is a good example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Artificial is a good example. That's, that's one of those, that's one of those issues that, you know, it's been out there forever and it'll probably continue to be out there forever. But to have you guys coming in and, and just basically, I mean, letting everybody know, there's probably a lot of people that didn't even realize that was a much of an issue, right? And so you're, yeah. again, bringing awareness to it, you know, and it's not like, and I can't remember exactly, you know, the, the stance or whatever. And, and do you guys, when you go into the, say, artificial, are you taking, I mean, how does that look, like taking a stance? Do you, you probably have, I mean, because you guys don't have all the science, there's other people that are doing that, but you just let them tell their story. Is that kind of how, how you work it? There's a really powerful network around Patagonia. We we don't act as kind of leader as much as we act as incubator or connector. You know, we're hub kind of as opposed to the you know the outer periphery of it, if you will. Um, and we are surrounded by a really powerful group of of environmentalists and scientists and academics and nonprofits that are all committed to clean and wild water and, and wild fish, just like just like we are. Um, so within that came both the science and the narrative around it's time to ask questions about the real value of hatcheries, both the open net pen fish farms, as well as the sort of the hatcheries that are supporting a lot of our recreation. What is the value that we're getting? What's the cost that we're getting? You know, and we could have come in and tried to try to have that conversation at a really micro level, but then we don't create the moment. We don't create the questioning, the ongoing questioning in our community of, you know, I wonder what this means. I wonder what this means to me, you know, how do I come to change my perspective on this aspect, this issue in my own community? Yeah, that's it. No, that's great. And, and you know, I think about this, and again, this question has come up a lot for me because I always will be talking about something on the podcast, and I'll, I'll think of, you know, something you guys have done. But how do you, when you're out there, you know, how do you help others empower other brands, right? Because I, I think they could look at you and say, wow, Patagonia is doing this, but there's still a lot of brands, even in fly fishing, right, that probably could do a better job. Are there things you're trying to do out there to let those people know what you're doing or do they just kind of they see what you're doing and that's that's good enough and they should be taken following some of the the actions you guys do yeah it's a that's a that's a good question i don't as i sit here today i don't know that i feel like we do enough you know we operate with relatively you know high expectations it's the covid disruption of industry connection is is i think a part of what i'm thinking through as well we were you know, excited to be an ongoing part of the work at, at F10 IFTD and, mm-hmm. um, you know, and we've had some, we've had some disruption there, you know, we are really successful. So to a really basic degree, our success and the principles by which we drive our success, we hope inspires others yep. to be able to make the same decisions. You can operate really ethically. You can be different. You can, you know, break the rules and sue presidents and you can still be a profoundly successful, successful brand. Yep. Um, we make available a lot of, of what we do. There's not a lot. There's certainly things here that are proprietary, but there's a lot fewer than you would, you would think. Um, we certainly have courted other brands that have been courted by other brands who wanted to understand our approach to materials. You know, how is it that we run a business that is predominantly made up of recycled inputs, um, you know, and, and what does that mean and, and how do you do that? Yeah. Or, uh, the older one you guys put, I think this was way back, like many years ago, but organic cotton, right? Wasn't that yeah. a piece there where you guys were? And again, that's one of those things where probably people said, there's no way you can do that and be efficient or, or have a business around that. But that's something that Patagonia implemented, right? Yeah. They thought people, I think thought we were nuts. Um, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a dramatic move and we didn't do it subtly. We made a call and shifted a, a business that was in a relatively significant growth phase to a supply chain that you know, effectively, effectively didn't exist um, and then built it, you know, it was like, it was like bolting the wings on as you were taken off kind of, kind of approach. And now we're beyond that. Now we're looking at regenerative organic cotton, right? Not, not just organic cotton, but you know, farming practices and agricultural practices that are, you know, beyond sustainable, giving back, creating more positive benefit than there was you know, before us. That idea of regeneration, it really drove the extension of organic cotton. I think it's really important to our future as well. You know, is sustainable enough anymore. If I'm just checking the box and not improving it, then I may not be getting, you know, anywhere. And organic cotton, our, our shift to organic cotton came from a moment in our retail stores where we realized by putting product in the basement of a store that was off-gassing some of the chemicals that at the time were used to treat normal cotton. You know, we created an environment that was shocking to us. What, what do you mean the product that we're building and selling to people needs time to off gas that what is what is that how do we do this differently that pivoted us hard you know and that was that was the point from which we made the leap there will be no more normal cotton this business will be built on organic cotton go figure it out 
that's a very Patagonia wow. way of doing things. You know? Yeah, go figure it out. Kind of like the, I think of the, uh, you know, the space like exploration, right? When, when Kennedy said, yep. you know what, go do it. Like, we don't know yeah. how you're going to do it, but go, is that kind of what you guys get to? It's like, just go make it happen, even when it seems impossible. Yeah. I, I think of it, I hope this one doesn't get me in trouble. I'm likely yeah. to say something here that gets me in trouble, but <laughs> I hope it's not this one. You know, instigation leadership is how I think of it. You know, it's, it's like we, we get agitated by these big ideas. We get more uncomfortable with our role in it or the way we view kind of our impact. And we get, you know, there's these lofty, lofty, lofty ideas. We are in business to save our home planet. There couldn't be a loftier mission statement, right? And it, and it instigates us. It agitates us. It inspires us to go try to solve for un, underneath that. Um, regenerative is one that's out in front of us. How do you build product? Is it possible to build the product that Patagonia makes so that the creation of product has a neutral or positive impact mm -hmm. on the planet? You know, and right now it doesn't. There's nothing that we make in our industry, in our yeah. brand, anywhere that doesn't have some it relatively yeah. could be small, could be large, but a, a negative sum, right? It, we're taking as we create. And so what does that look like if we really lean into regeneration? And I think to a really large degree, that's inspired our approach to warmware, you know, and what does it mean to not build from new, but build from things we've, we've already built. Yeah, that's right. And that goes along with the, also you have that program, which is repairing, right? You have people can go get their stuff repaired and, and talk about that a little bit, because that's a great program. Maybe people don't know about, but is that to apply to just Patagonia gear? And is there like, how does this work? This program? We run a repair facility here in the U.S., a, a big one in Europe as well that they just launched. It is a big initiative for us. You know, the, one of the best ways to minimize the impact of product creation is to create less product, right? And this is a for-profit brand that's saying that, but again, we've already agreed that we're, you know, we're unique. And so how do you help people need less product? You build highly durable, versatile goods. You build highly functional product and you build product that can be easily kept in field, right? That's what we want. I don't want to build a waiter or a boot and be excited when you replace it in two years, even though you right. rang the cash register. Yeah. I want to build waiters and boots that you never replace or that when you have to fix it, it's so intuitive that you're able to fix it on your own and keep that alive, right? The best waiter is the waiter that is still fishing with you. The best boot is the boot that's still fishing with you, the ones that we get to hand down. So, you know, repair, we kind of come at repair from that perspective. But if you're, if you're in Europe or if you're in the United States and you check out our websites, you'll see access to both our repair facilities. And we love mm -hmm. repairing product, um, product that we can't repair. We take down and build into other things. You know, if ultimately we can't go get a second value out of it, um, we convert it back into its own raw materials and begin the process of reusing it again. You know, a, a huge, 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 well over 90% of product that we make as a global brand is using recycled inputs for material. Um, and so we sort of hit that mark and now we're, okay, what do we do next? Yep. What's the next step? That's what you guys are always trying to stay ahead of the curve on the, on the conservation yep. end of it. That's it. Yes. What is, I would like to hear, you know, because I haven't had Yvonne on the podcast, you know, yet, and I, I hope to maybe get him on eventually, but, um, you know, talk about, because he is the man, right? He's the guy that created this thing, and it's such a cool story. Can you give us a little bit of the story for those that haven't heard that story about how he, I know it started with, like, climbing, right? He was a climber, and yep. uh, can you give us a little history there, just so people understand, like, we are where you are now with this new mission from where you came from? I'll give you a light version, although that's probably best served in, in his voice. Um, yep. And if you and, and I'm sure you have, Dave, but if the listeners haven't read Let My People Go Surfing, that's the, yeah, you know, that's it. Yeah, that's the that's our form that's of, uh, yeah, that's the book for sure. That's where we that's that's the core canon. We go back to that one quite a bit. Yeah. You know, Yvonne was a uh, you know, he's been an outdoor athlete. You know, his whole life um, was living in Southern California and really climbing into the you know the Yosemite and the Sierras and the the big mountains here in California, forging pitons in a in a tin shed at the slaughterhouse down here in Ventura, you know, putting them up in the trunk of his car, driving around selling them and then when done selling them he would he would go climbing deep love affairs with surf climb and you know and fish that became a business and he began to import some product to be sort of build around the the lifestyle if you will you know an early rugby shirt is the beginning of our sportswear business um i believe there's an early fleece that is based on uh toilet bowl covers or toilet hmm. seat covers or something to that effect imagine a big big kind of shaggy pile fleece yeah. you know and the business sort of grew and grew and grew from there all the way through at its core was this idea of 
highly functional product in endemic sports spaces that were working to balance the business and the impact it, it created. And that stays true through today. There's a number of chapters in there, chapters of yeah. growth, chapters of focus. You know, we've, yeah. we've, we've, we've kind of went from, you know, early climbing business that broke off from what we are today and became Black Diamond. So Patagonia and Black mm. Diamond have a, have a shared history early on. Um, we have, um, you know, the, the rugby shirt grew into a meaningful sportswear business. Um, we've broadened the sports that we sort of focus on along the way. Um, you know, each of those is a, is, a, is, a, is a pivot, if you will. And each of those is sort of a, I would tell you, it's a recommitment to our, our core values. You know, do as little harm as possible, build the best product we possibly can, and operate in a way that really helps us understand our impact while creating an environment where employees are enabled to balance work and life really well. Yeah, that's it. And and the fishing gear, when you look at that, it's, uh, you know, you of course have got the boots and waders. I mean, how did you guys choose? Because there are different products you could have out there, and I'm not sure about the whole line, but, um, you know, how'd that look like when you first chose, like, okay, these are the products. And I, was it, were waders and boots, was that always a first piece of, of what you guys got into? They've been in here for a while. The, the really early products are um, some shells and some packs and some apparel. You know, we had started to build expertise in fabrics and raw materials, and then that was applied to those sports, you know, and then we've kind of grown into them from there. You know, waders have been around for a, quite a long while, along with jackets and packs and other apparel. Boots are probably the, the most recent ad, but they've been in the business for, you know, 15 or 20 years or more as, as well. And now a quick break and a word from our sponsor. Fishhound Expedition is putting together remote Alaskan wilderness trips for you to do that trip of a lifetime. These are not your lodge style trip. This is the remote Alaskan river float trips where you will be fishing for salmon, mousing for trout, uh, having campfires, drinking a few beers along the river. Pretty much if you love the river trip in a remote part of the world, this is the trip for you. Adam, the founder of Fishhound Expeditions, was on a recent uh, podcast episode and talked about his passion and why this has always been a huge dream for him. And now he's built this amazing uh, business. And uh, and if you want to dig into it and find out more about Alaska, check in with Adam right now. We're going to be heading out there this fall for a big trip. We're going to be floating down and uh, taking some photos, digging into it. So if you're interested in connecting um, on one of these trips, check in with Adam right now at Fishhound Expeditions. You can find them at wetflyswing.com slash fishhound. That's F-I-S-H-H-O-U-N-D to connect with Adam and uh, find out what they have going on right now. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to Fishhound. Okay, back to the show. And I've been thinking about something on this. You talked about a different way to do it, but the slowing of growth. I know I've heard that along the way where you guys have actually talk about that. What does that mean? Because most companies think like, you know, growth, you got to always how you, and I know you're a private company, so you can do a lot of different things, but what does that mean? Slowing growth. And why would you want to do that? That is another, that's a, that's a good one. And that is definitely another unique aspect of this brand. Um, we have an uncomfortable relationship with growth as a brand and as a, community of, of people, you know, the, the internal and external stakeholders and, and sort of fans and employees of this place have an uncomfortable relationship with growth. We want to be successful. We really believe in the product that we build. And so you know, we believe we're building as ethical a product as can be made right now, always striving for more, but as ethical as we can make right now. And so to a certain degree, we know that the more of the most ethical product we can build and sell, you know, we're helping people make really good choices and product that minimize impact. And growth has impact and growth has cost. And, you know, we're uncomfortable with that reality. We don't believe, you know, and if we don't believe in the hollow promise of infinite growth on a finite resource, our planet is a finite resource. Our natural resources are finite. Our clean water is finite. Our clean air is finite. Our ability to pump carbon into the atmosphere is finite. And so underneath that, how can we consider for ourselves a space where we can grow infinitely? against this precious life supporting resource that is limited, that will only last so long, right? And that is a part of the way that I think we come at both this tension of growth, why would Patagonia slow its growth, as well as a commitment to, to regeneration. You know, one of the ways that we can enable for everybody, you know, the ability to, to lean into growth against a finite set of resources is to create these 
practices that are regenerative so that we're you know creating more opportunity if you will by giving back as we create and sell not just taking 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 and then lastly you know covid for a lot of brands you know was a look in the mirror moment um, and we did not waste that crisis we looked hard we looked at ourselves internally we looked at the way we build product we looked at the way the brand shows up we looked at how we use our voice across a you know, broad intersection of communities, environmental, more and more social and, and social justice space. And we sort of challenged ourselves, to, you know, in, in the way that this brand has done that, let's recommit to what we believe in in the face of this, this transformation. And we felt like there was places that we could put our energy internally and externally that would do more to save the planet than if we just continued to enable the growth that was are right. It's there. We could be a bigger business if we want it to be, and we don't. We don't choose to be. And by not choosing to be, it allows us to focus on some of these other things. And regeneration being a big piece of that. Gotcha. That's it. Yeah, the regeneration. And again, you're setting. You know, setting the standards. That's just one of those things you hear about. It's like, oh, slowing growth. It gets people thinking again. Oh, what does that mean? And then they dig into it and they learn. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's different ways to do this. We don't always have to be. You know making more and more and more. And, and that's the challenge, I guess, with the public, you know, maybe a different company that's publicly traded, right? Where they yeah. have, they have people and boards and things that. There was a book written in the early seventies by a economic theorist named EF Schumacher. And the book is called small is beautiful. Um, and there's a number of books that sort of highlight this. There's some recent work going on around regenerative finance and economy. That's really you know, powerful coming out of a group called the Capital Institute. Anyways, Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, is where some of this infinite growth to finite resource, you know, and how does that work? He coined the idea of a, a Buddhist capitalism, you know, and the in the the Reader's Digest version of Small is Beautiful is that if, if we really, at a, at a global level, a global community level, if we operate all of these businesses for enough, there is enough for all these businesses. It's only in the, the disproportional indexing of some to get lots and and many to get less, you know, that we start to create an erosion of our ability to support everyone. And so if people are really interested in that idea of regenerative economics, regenerative finance, I'd start with Schumacher. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll put a link to uh, in the show notes to that for sure. And anything else we talk about today, I'll throw it out there. Um, you know, a big thing is, you know, and this comes back, like, even like my family, people out there, you, you hear, like, there's a lot of negative stuff going on, right, with the planet. And it seems like sometimes you get over there and be like, wow, can we really do anything with things? And you know what I mean? People, that's, that's the pessimistic. I'm more optimistic. I'm always thinking like, yeah, you know, even though the steelhead runs, for example, are really, you know, down, there's, you know, there's these cycles and there's still some things we can do to help them recover, right? And things like that. Yeah. How do you deal with that when you look at Because you guys are leading the way on a lot of this stuff, but it's still a planet that there's a lot of negative stuff going on out, you know, out there. What's your thoughts there when you look at that? Dave, you're hitting the good ones. Um <laughs> That's a big one. This is about as big as it gets because yeah. you guys, it's your mission. And and we're at a place with, and you think of like nuclear war, right? There's all this crazy oh. stuff going on. And I know Yvonne, I'm sure he has a strong opinion on this as well because he's he's it's him, right? He's right in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we balance optimism and pragmatism. But you, I mean, you're talking about one of the core emotional tensions of of, of a Patagonia employee um, is, is this is that is that sentiment. You know, how do you how do you live in the urgent reality of what the world needs, you know, but still come to work every day and knock it out of the out of the park? Um, yeah, we you know, I think if I if I kind of unpack this answer, we're a, mm -hmm. we're a community of people that really support one another. You know, this is a very people centric brand. We take care of each other a lot, you know, and let my people go surfing is as much mm -hmm. about work life balance as it is about, you know, keep our batteries charged so that we can do the you know, the important work. Um, we believe in the power of together, us together as a brand, us together as a broad community, us together as a global community of anglers. We believe in the ability for us to, to get the work done. But maybe most practically, and I've, I've heard Yvonne answer this a couple of times at various shows and tours pre-COVID, what are we going to do? Stick our thumb up our ass? We're just going to sit here? Like that isn't going to cut it either, right? So, right. so e even in the most fatalistic of outcomes, we're going to go down swinging, yeah. right? If this is where we're at, then let's, then let's dig in and do the work. And let's let's give it hell and let's see what can happen because to roll over on it to continue to live in the you know in the consumptive convenience of sort of classic capitalism no way right i want to sleep at night i want to look my kids in the eyes you know i, I want to be able to feel like i was a part of that and I, I think that sentiment drives a lot of of us as employees and ultimately it drives the collective power of this brand yeah yeah that's that's a great answer that's i mean that's 
because that's basically it. Yeah, you got two choices. You know, you could do something, you know, or you could do nothing. And and yeah, it's it's challenging because yeah. then you add in, you know, you do add in politics and religion and all these other things. The, the stuff you don't talk about on the fishing trip, right? That's the, you know, you're on a guided trip or whatever. And like, you know, politics, religion, actually even conservation. It's crazy. It's like conservation has kind of become this political thing. I mean, talk about that. How does conservation become a political thing because it seems like it is out there. Do you see it as a, as a really, and is it all issues or just the really big ones that kind of get political? We're hitting all the high points here. You know, I, I, unfortunately, I think the, the narrative of our country is right now designed to politicize and divide. I don't, I don't know that necessarily. And I think all we see is the edges and sometimes we miss the, you know, the, the middle. um, And the social media and stuff is like just fuel to the fire. Right. Uh, shoot your TV, sink your yep. phone. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Right. Let's go yeah. back to analog. I think we'd be better off off for it. Yeah. Or, or talking. I always say the talking face to face. It's like, like we're talking face to face. I mean, you can't be an, yeah. a- you know, if you're looking at somebody in the eye, it's hard to, yeah. right. So that, and that's the challenge yeah. is out there. These emails and texts and, and all the social, like you're not looking at anybody. It's just like, you're just throwing no. stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. From behind the veil, from behind the wall. Yeah. Um, we don't view conservation as a, uh, as political we view the planet as the you know and the natural resources is the you know the rights the assets of of all you know and we don't think it is a you know that really it's the politicization we don't think there's an agenda that's running through conservation that's meant to be anti-business remember at the foundation it's like who promised you infinite growth on a finite resource you know and why does that make sense you know and if you're winning so and others lose like that that can't be okay that can't be the solution Together, we're better than that. Why can't we come together and solve for that? We also understand really powerfully conservation is an economic engine. You know, when we look at some of the states that drive large portions of their GDP with recreation, right, they've recognized that, you know, and and even more so in the last few years with all the participatory growth, conservation is jobs and taxes. There's a really Mm -hmm. powerful business around the outdoor industry that is at times much bigger than the businesses that dominate some of the narrative, whether that's oil and gas or big farm or big ag. In aggregate, you know, what you and I are talking about, what it represents at an economic level is a potent force. So, you know, we don't hug trees because we love trees. We hug trees because we believe we need them to support our humanity. We hug trees because we believe that the recreation that, that they help us create is a powerful economic you know, engine. And we hug trees because we understand that life needs to be lived in a balance. And then when we're out of balance, we've, we've missed something. We're certainly out of whack with an idea of regeneration. When we're not operating in a balance of the, of the man-made and the natural, right? And, and yeah. so you, if you look at our narrative, you know, we push back hard on the blind industrialization of nature. And we ask, why do you think this makes sense? Why do dams make sense? Why do hatcheries make sense? Why do these things make sense? You know, and, and left alone, what we believe is that nature finds a balance that will work for all of us. And underneath that, we begin to open up the economic opportunities of outdoor rec and outdoor businesses. That's a, that's a gr- another great answer. Um, that one's not super popular. You know, like, no. like you and our, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. that one can, there, there certainly will be a differing opinion out there about what some of that looks like. And the belief that, the natural resources and asset that can be leveraged by those who can access it for their own gain. And we just don't, we don't espouse to that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and we've heard some stories, uh, you know, we recently had a, uh, like Indie fly was on and they were talking about the local, again, it's going back to this local communities and, and helping them, right. Take care of their, and I kind of asked some of the questions there is like, God, you got a powerful forces trying to take down the forest, right. And some of these, the Amazon and there's, and it seems challenging, but again, I think it's getting back to that local, like you guys have said, you, you empower the local groups, um, you know, to take charge and kind of lead, lead from the, as opposed to top down, right? You guys are leading from yeah. the, trying to lead from the other end. Yes, indeed. We, we just released a film called Tribal Waters that looks at the oh wow Wind River Reservation and the indigenous community of the winds and the relationship that they have with the, with water and the state of Wyoming and how they're reclaiming some of that power. Um, it was a, a film we launched in partnership with Teen Town Gravity and, and Indie Fly. Oh, right. I didn't even it's, know that. We, yeah. There you go. We talked a whole, yeah. And we dug in a little bit into the wind river and I know that's a, a, a huge, you know, a huge topic. And that's the thing is that a lot of this stuff, sometimes you see, you know, some stuff that's going on outside of the U S but that's a powerful thing. And really that's powerful because you're talking about not only, the conservation, but indigenous people, right? There's a whole nother issue of, of think of the, you know, yeah. the history there. And, and again, the struggles, like for some reason, that's another struggle for people like, you know, because there's this, again, there's probably, there's the racist thing going there as well. But 
Yeah. Um, so that's good to hear. You got that going. Um, so Tribal Waters is a good one. Another one I was thinking about, maybe we can just go on a quick little run of some of the, the programs you guys are supporting. But I know River Horse uh, Nakadate, he's, we've had him on, and he's down like in the Boundary Waters, right? Another big issue that's going on. How, what are some of the big, just give us a little rundown, and maybe if some folks don't know the, the key, some of the programs, and, or some of the, the conservation issues around the country that you guys are working on. What's going on there? And then give us a couple that maybe are coming up. Uh, okay, let's let me let me see if I can gather them all right. We we started with the fact that we've got a really long list of things that we're focused on. I'm definitely going to miss a few, so apologies yeah, yeah. to those partners whom I miss. But if I start uh, right to left, you know, we've got some work going on with the folks that are trying to protect Frenchman's Bay up in Maine on a open net pen proposal mm-hmm. that is coming in there that we think is a a, a terrible mistake. Um, we're continuing to work to support the striper community of the East Coast and really looking at the relationship that commercial fishing, the you know, the what's happening in those in those fisheries and how are we making sure they're they're vibrant, um, kind of coming across to boundary waters, ensuring that we continue to protect that from extractive economies that ultimately will destroy that resource and eliminate its ability to be an economic engine for that for that region. We've got a relatively big focus on Colorado River watershed in partnership with the Nature Conservancy. You know, and, and how do we continue to make sure that there's a balance of the of the water rights across that multitude of stakeholders so that all parties are supported? Um, there's going to continue to be ongoing focus in the northern Rockies around the impact of climate change and climate crisis. We're seeing that, you know, as we're all kind of living through that combination of, of floods and fires. Um, continuing to move to the left coast, if you will, you know, we're we're with heavy hearts um, anticipating the ongoing demise of the wild steelhead in the Pacific Northwest. You know, that's a hard one to look at, but we can kind of feel, feel that one coming, coming back down to our home state of California, you know, really focused on water and climate crisis, you know, and what that's going to mean to this state as we are, you know, literally running dry. And that's just the United States. You know, there's a list that would exist for Europe who's done phenomenal work, you know, really, really lobbying and navigating for the elimination of dams. Um, we have a, a, a large voice in the pushback on these open net pens and these sort of industrial hatcheries and what they what they really mean. Um, we're beginning to look at the relationship that kind of unconscious capitalism has on and what that means to the choices our consumers are making and how do we help lead people towards a more conscious consumer, a conscious form of capitalism that's related to climate overall. And then continuing to come all the way underneath that, we're really beginning the early work of exploring the intersection of environmental justices and social justices. And you'll see, you know, New Talk would be a film that we launched not long ago that begins to explore that idea. There is a connectivity. And those places where the environment has been extracted for the gain of a few has likely left many with less than they need. And how do we create awareness around those? And how do we get our broad communities thinking differently about the role we all play in those moments? That's it. That's a heavy list, but that's, yeah, you know, that's and a good I, summary. I'm, I'm sure I missed something, but that gives you some, some perspective. Yeah. And I'll put some links to some videos and some snippets in the show notes as well. Um, what are, you know, so you guys, again, I've said, you know, through this, we've had a lot of folks on here that have been connected to Patagonia or they've, you know, you've kind of supported them. Are there other companies out there? I mean, you guys are a, ju- a big company, but are there other companies maybe even bigger around the world, around the country that you see as doing a similar work? Are there a lot of companies out there? Or are there a few? Or do you guys, are you just kind of in your own zone doing your thing? And you're like, this is us. No, we're not alone. Yeah. You know, I think we're, we're vocal and visible. Um, and in the way that, you know, within the, the purview of an outdoor industry or an angling industry, we cast a big shadow, but you yeah. know, we're, we're not alone. And when you look at the work, it's happening in some of the really large brands, you know, that scale well beyond our, you know, our impact and our revenue. There's great work happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was, was it Mr. Rogers that said, look for the helpers, right? When it goes wrong. And I think that's a good opportunity right now. The weight, it's easy to turn our phones and TVs on and just read the headlines and want to pull the covers up over your head, but look, look yeah. for the helpers, dig in and do the work, create the awareness for yourself, right? There's, there's work happening all over the place and find the thing that's important to you and find a place to, to lean in. You know, we are not alone in it, we, but we do cast a relatively large shadow in the world that you and I operate. Yeah, yeah and and the bulk of brands, you know, not the bulk of brands in our business and the bulk of brands in outdoor are are striving to do the same work, are challenging themselves to minimize their impact and build product more ethically. You know, partially because I think brands like us who pioneered it have been successful at conditioning the consumer to expect it. 
You know, and that's important. We want more and more consumers asking, do I need this? What's it made of? Who made it? How are these communities taken care of, right? If those filters around the things we buy, the brands will follow, right? So that's the power we have as consumers. Mm -hmm. At the end of this thing is people who buy stuff, right? And when yeah. they are aware and when they ask the right questions, the brands will have to follow suit, right? So as consumers, never mind, you know, industry leaders, as consumers, we have an awful lot of control if we pause in that moment of consumption and set ourselves up to make a really good decision. Yeah. And are we the, you know, the U.S. again, we're, we're known as this overconsumptive country. I mean, is it, um, it's kind of strange, right? I mean, is, is that unique? Are there other places around the, the world where you see, I mean, a ultra uber consumptive like us? Are we just, are we the leader on that, on the negative side? That's just us. I think we're, well, that, that'd be one that we're winning and wish we weren't. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think there's aspects of it. I mean, through the lens of our business, there's aspects of it in, a lot of regions, but nothing like we see we see here. No. Yeah, and that's just big. Obviously, we have a lot of money, but so how do you guys think about? I mean, you've probably talked about this today, but how as a as a company, or not even as a company yourself, but just the bigger picture, saving the planet? How do we get people in this country that don't think about that? Right, they're just buying another thing, throwing the plastic thing in the garbage, right, and more than it's going to landfill, and those landfills are floating out in the ocean, right, and all this crazy stuff. You know, or is that something you guys are thinking about? I mean, that's how do we get yes. those people to change their mind that maybe don't even know about Patagonia? We introduce them to us or others. You know, we, we believe that the product has to carry the narrative, right? So we, we don't build product that just to get to the transaction. You know, I think that would be the, the classic and historical form is you build product so that it rings the register. And that's that's not enough for us. You know, we want product to be impactful beyond the transaction. We want people to think about the what and why of products so that over time, you know, they're starting to be conditioned to ask these these different questions. And then the conversation you and I had about connecting global brand to endemic impact, we, we use the power brand to create awareness, to really push back, you know, the monster in our closet, another film that we released recently. It's a short look at what does it cost when you buy a piece of apparel? You know, and what yeah. was behind that and what's the reality of the impact that the global apparel business has, Patagonia included, a look at ourselves in a way that was, you know, mildly uncomfortable. So we really believe yeah. that product carries important narrative. So how and why we build product, we hope over time gets customers thinking differently. And that at yeah. a global, at a, at a content, at a, at a media level, we know that the brand has enough power that as we raise these issues, people are engaging it at a really high level and beginning to rethink or sort of what this looks like. So we've talked about films today that push back against the industrialization of nature, films that explore the impact of environmental injustices and social injustices, films that challenge us in terms of what we buy and we're hanging in our closet and the impact that all had. Those are giant topics, yeah, full of nuance. Yeah. And we've pushed the conversation so far and made people uncomfortable, uncomfortable. within that. Yeah. Yeah. To begin to create that yeah. moment of, I need to rethink what this looks like. I love that. Yeah. So that's, it, it is it, you know, getting uncomfortable, right? I think that everybody's sitting back and I think a lot of people are too comfortable, you know, everything's just yeah. coming to them where they got to, yeah, it's good to be uncomfortable, right. And to try new things and to explore. Um, so let's take a quick example. So, you know, say we were putting together, we are doing some of these trips, right. We're trying to help, uh, you know, listeners explore the country and things like that. And we're trying to support some conservation groups, you know, like we're trying to find certain groups in these areas we're going to, but just flying in an airplane, right. Is, is, you know, that's adding to our footprint, right. Um, on the carbon stuff. And, but, you know, going to these places and then supporting, how would you, if you gave me advice to really support that local group, other than, you know, we're going to get them on the show, we're going to promote them. What, what do you think we could do? What could I do with this podcast, with this this thing we have going with our business to help support them? What do you think is like a few items, you words of advice? I, this, this may, I may be operating in some of my idealism, but I, I think part of it is people don't know. Right, we create this discomfort, this instigation, agitation, and people don't know where to put it. What do I do with it? Right. So Dave, helping people understand that if you're heading to this place to fish, you know, take a half a day and volunteer with this group. Right. You know, or, you know, put down our right to fish and target these species all the time and balance it with the need yeah. to put work in so the fish will continue to be there. Right. And in that exactly. way, we begin to open up a bit of that concept of regeneration. Kind of yeah. working inside a, a whole system where we're giving back and ensuring that the system will be perpetuated. 
That's easy. Yeah, no, that's a great one. That's easy. That's, you, know, you go there and just get people to actually get on the ground and take it, as opposed to like giving money, like literally get them to volunteer and work with the group. That's way more powerful, right, than actually giving yeah. money. And that action works. There's a lot of filters that you can put on this. It doesn't take much in a Google search to find nonprofits regionally that align with our values. For Patagonia, we call it Action Works. And if you check out Action Works online, you can put in your zip code or the zip code you're traveling to. And you'll see the organizations that we've supported over time and aligned by their topics. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's clean water, maybe it's clean air, maybe it's climate justice, maybe it's social justices, right? Cool. Great. Here's the folks that we know in your zone or the zone that you're traveling to reach out. They'd love to hear from you. They would love the support. That's perfect. Nice. Repair your gear. Don't buy new stuff so much. Yeah. Let's yeah. No, I love the lot. I love the repair of the gear because the waiters is such a good example. I mean, waiters and boots, I mean, waiters has been such a, a pain for a lot of people over the years because waiters, I mean, I think maybe the tech's better now, but I mean, that's a challenging thing. Literally, you're putting, you're trashing on these things. I mean, how do you get that thing to last more than, you know, a couple years, right? And, and you guys, yeah. you're working on that. I mean, what do you think is a good, and I always used to use the 10-year rule, like, you know, my boots should last at least 10 years, right? I mean, like stuff that's... But it seems like a lot of products don't last even close to 10 years. So I mean, do you guys have a focus on timing? Let's just take your waiters, for example. Is there, a, is there a thing where you say these things should last this certain year? Or how do you get into that conversation? We test the 400 days, right? That's sort of like you know, 400 days of use. So before we put it in market, we want to know that it'll get you know, that long. And then we, we work to design into its repairability. How easily can this product be repaired, whether it's at home or from, uh, you know, from a, a Reno, our, our repair center here in the, you know, in the U S um, and the reality is, is that there's very few people that can put 400 days in a waiter, you know, even over a lifetime, that's a pretty elite group of us that get the luxury yeah. of fishing that much, you know, but we're building against that sentiment so that we can ensure it will be, you know, as long as we can. Waiters are the, one of the trickier products I've ever had the honor to work around. It will fail. There's, yeah. you know, if, if you do the thing we really hope you do in your waiter, you're like get on your feet, go Call. find your fish. <laughs> yeah. Like spend time with people yeah. you care about in places you care about, you yeah. know, the, the waiter will fail. So as opposed to avoiding failure of a waiter, we ensure that we've got ways to kind of give it its second and, and third life. And then boots, the, you know, Danner, when we launched the river salt, oh, yeah. the foot tractor. Yeah. yeah. That was really, that was, can you build a boot for a lifetime? It was almost an internal experiment. Can you, yep. you know, is it possible to build a boot for a lifetime? And it, yes, and not, you know, we learned a lot along the way. I think you'll see us come out with, you know, evolutions of that thinking here in the future. But, but yeah, if, if we fulfill the commitment as anglers and, you know, and, and, and global citizens, if you will, if we really take care of gear, if we're buying gear that's built to last, if we're coming home and, and being careful with gear and putting the time in the gear, ensuring that the boots are conditioned, ensuring that they're yep. clean, ensuring that the waders are clean, putting them away appropriately at the end of season, checking them for the pinhole leak so they don't become a problem, right. we'll get as long as we can. Now, again, we hope you fish so much that you even wear ours out. And that's awesome. And when you do, let's get ourselves into the next best product. But a lot of the product that, you know, I think people are accessing is getting turned over in a year or two. And yeah. I think as an industry, we're capable of better than that. Better than that. That's perfect. Cool. All right, uh, Ted. Uh, so give a heads up. We're just looking out, say, the rest of this year, you know, into the next year. Do you have uh, anything new coming for you or Patagonia you want to give a shout out to? You can give us a heads up on. It could be product line or movies or, yeah, I'm not sure if you've talked about it today. We have a, we've been partnering with uh, Boreo. So reclaiming fish nets for oh, yeah. um, put into some recycled product. We have a, a kick-ass fishing jacket called the Swift Current Jacket that comes nice. out this fall. You will see an extension of our Wild Fish Activist campaign this summer, sort of celebrating not only the powerful anglers in our community, but the environmentalists and stewards and academics that really make the thing home. We've been really proud of that that platform. We'll, we'll continue to, to to lean hard into that. Um, we have a number of internal processes that are helping us build product more intentionally, you know, particularly around the impact that product has and the life cycle that product has. So there's a lot of focus that and energy that'll be put, you know, on that harder for your listeners to see, but it'll be present in product starting in spring 23 and beyond. We launched a new wading boot in Europe and we have oh, wow. another new wading boot coming out here shortly in the U S um, the wading boot we launched in Europe was built with Fitwell. And it's only in Europe right now. It's a lightweight hike for your fish 
wading boot called Fora Canyon in Italian, excellent boot. And as we mature our relationship with Fitwell, we hope to bring it to the U.S. And then we're launching a similar boot uh, with Danner in spring 23. And again, it's another kind of hike to find your fish boot, lightweight boot, you know, really fitting with what we're seeing in our angling community. You know, and we'll always build the expedition level stuff, but we're seeing a lot of the new participants really put a pack on their back and move upstream to try to find places where there are clean fish, wild fish, right? And we like that idea. We like yeah. the idea that anglers are building, you know, deep roots into this community, learn your skills, learn your water, learn your ethics commit to the nonprofits, like be a whole angler, not just the version of this where we you know, live in the joy of catching, but the holistic approach. That's it. That's perfect summary. So, uh, so right, Ted, uh, I think that's about it. I mean, I definitely could chat with you. I would love to dig in more to this, but I'll, I'll leave it maybe till another one down the line. And uh, just want to say thanks for spending the time today. And if anybody has questions, we'll send them out. Yeah, obviously, Patagonia.com. But uh, anything else we'll have in the show notes, all the, the kind of actions we talked about today where people can actually support your mission and, and kind of move, move forward. Dave, I appreciate it. Thank you for the time today. It was nice to get a chance to chat, and I would look forward to doing it again. So there it is. Pretty powerful stuff, right? We dug into it. Wetflyswing.com slash 345. 345 will get you some links. Uh, this will get you some videos, and we're going to have some probably some good stuff over there uh, that digs into a little bit more about what we talked about and a chance for you uh, to connect to some of those resources. Episodes like this, you kind of have to take a break, and uh, they're not always easy. Uh, we got into some big questions. Um, and I feel like it's important to keep uh, digging into this and having everybody think about think about it daily, right? Um, what can we do today? Even if it's small, even if it's tiny, super tiny, what can we do today to make a difference? It's that small group, that one person that starts it all. And, uh, and as I think about it, uh, talking to my my friends, you know, this comes up, it's like, we had a recent conversation, which I brought up saying, hey, how are we doing? I mean, this this episode got me thinking about that, right? Like, how are we doing? Literally, are we destroying our planet? And uh, a couple of them said, you know what? Let's uh, let's just enjoy the sunshine. Let's enjoy the sunshine today and, and not, uh, not think about that. Um, but I think we kind of have to think about it, right? I mean, it, it's always there. Not that we have to let it consume us. And definitely enjoying um, enjoying this world is amazing. But but also, what can we do? What can we do today? That's what I'm, I guess I'm thinking about. I'm moving in ahead in this one. What can I do today? What's one thing I can do to change things um, for the better, for my kids, for the kids' kids? And, uh, and so the planet doesn't increase by 10 degrees in, uh, in the next 50 years. Okay, so this is a. <laughs> I'm going to leave this on a positive note, though. So that's my that's my rant. The positive note is is that yes, we do have some great groups out there, uh, great companies, great people doing great things. So I think the key is to connect with those people, and share the word and get the word out there and, and do your one thing today, whatever that is. All right. I don't know if it's uh, evening, if it's morning, if it's afternoon, if you are when this is that you're listening to this, but I hope you. Have a great day. I hope that maybe you can connect with us on that uh, on that trip, that next trip. That'd be that'd be super cool. Or if not, connect with me online, social media, or email. Thanks again. Have a good day, and let's stay optimistic. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.